So I'm going to speak to you about building a research question. Really, I'm going to go through sort of how my career has evolved and how I've built research questions along the way, because how you build a question depends on sort of what career stage you're at. Um, just a bit about me. I was born in Trinidad, which is this, or you, this little island here. It's the most southerly of the Caribbean islands. Um, for those of you who follow cricket, you might know Brian Lara. He's from Trinidad. Uh, and in those days, when I did medicine, the University of the West Indies was spread over three campuses and medicine was in Jamaica. The campus in Trinidad did engineering and Barbados did law. So I went to Jamaica to do medicine. <clears throat> and again, in those days, if you wanted to do to specialize in whatever area you wanted to do. Typically, you wanted to get the British qualification, so you had to go to the UK. <clears throat> I then went to the UK because then to do the Royal College exams, you had to do six months in the UK before you were eligible to sit the exam. So six months turned into 17 years, one wife and two children. Uh, but that's where I did my, you know, the core of my research. <clears throat> um, so I started off in Sheffield in the UK, but ended up in Newcastle in the north of England. For some reason, I was interested in doing a PhD at the time. I didn't know why. Uh, my subspecialty area of interest uh, within obstetrics and gynecology is reproductive medicine. So there are four subspecialties in ONG. Repro ReproMed is one. It's the most interesting for me. It's the one that combines surgery with medicine. And it also has a really positive um, focus, which is, you know, families and, and um, in helping families have children. Um, and at the time, there wasn't actually a defined clinical academic training path. Um, a clinical academic was basically somebody who did ad hoc research on the side. Um, so it was really quite a haphazard journey, how you built a career then. Um, and a clinical research fellowship came up in Newcastle at what was then a new um, development, the International Center for Life. Uh, and that's where the NHS IVF clinic was based. Uh, so I applied for this fellowship and these fellowships typically are for one year. You do a bit of clinical work and some research on the side. <clears throat> the salaries funded sort of privately within the unit. Um, and some of it is derived from the clinical service you provide. And it meant applying to the deanery for time off from the clinical rotation, which was always a struggle because the deanery's job is to get guys in post, train them up and cover the workload. The workload in obstetrics is labor ward. So they don't really like you to leave the workforce to do stuff that's not going to contribute to their workload. So that's always been a struggle. Uh, and the first um, sort of, so as you'll find in your clinical academic career, it's built around one serendipitous event after another. You know, it's quite, quite unpredictable. So the first one for me was when I met Alison Murdoch. She happened to come to Trinidad as the external examiner. So I met her when she came. It turns out that she was the director for the International Center for Life where I applied for this research fellowship, got it. And the research quest project on offer was about the spindle assembly checkpoint. How does that regulate the first meiotic division in new sites? So as you can imagine, as a clinician, when I read that, I had no clue what that was, but it was what was on offer. So you'll find that your first research questions are basically not designed by you, but it's going to be given to you by whatever expertise is available in your unit. 
So I'll tell you a bit about oocytes because my career since then has been based on this one cell type. Uh, so the oocyte is the cornerstone of reproduction and it provides virtually all the building blocks required by the embryo. So this here is a human oocyte, a scanning electron micrograph. And you can see only a portion of a human oocyte and how tiny sperm is. So I tell my patients, you know, sperm don't really contribute that much. It's all down to the egg. And it really is. Um, this is uh, images of pre-implantation embryo development at the top. I don't, is there a pointer on this? Here, this is a fertilized egg. Uh, and this is a 300 cell blastocyst after five to six days. And you can see this hasn't increased its cell mass. It's essentially the oocyte broken down into smaller cells. So the embryo is really only as good as the egg. And that's why you have this quite stark decline in pregnancy success. And you'll notice that that decline starts quite young in the early 30s. And that's because women are born with a fixed number of eggs. And as they get older, egg quality goes down. But it goes down about three decades before any other cell type in the body. And we know this is because of oocytes, because if we replace those older eggs with young eggs, the success rate is identical across all ages. And one major consequence of oocyte quality decline is chromosome abnormalities in embryos. So this is probably the most measurable consequence of declining egg quality. And you can see on the graph that after 37, aneuploidy rates really steep up as egg quality declines quite quickly. And as it turns out, this is because of errors in the first meiotic division. So if you remember your biology, um, gametes, sperm and eggs undergo two consecutive divisions to have their chromosome content. And in oocytes, the first of those divisions, which is M1, meiosis one, shown there, um, is where 80 to 90% of embryonic aneuploidy arises. Okay, so coming back to the question, it was about how is that first meiotic division regulated? And does it fall under the control of a spindle assembly checkpoint? A, a checkpoint regulates chromosome separation. So we've known for a long time that somatic cells have a very robust checkpoint. So aneuploidy in somatic cells is extremely low. So we, reason, we reckon that oocytes maybe didn't possess one. But anyway, that's how the question came about, okay? The point here is that it's a lab-based project. Um, but that said, IVF is one of the few clinical treatments among all treatments that's really focused on two cells, sperm and eggs. So you really should have a very good understanding of cell-based events, and in particular, things like fertilization and embryo development to be able to counsel patients. The problem is oocytes, mammalian oocytes, are in extremely short supply. Human oocytes are almost impossible to come by because of the ethical regulation. Um, so that was a major challenge. It's a lab-based project. Um, and as the project went along, I realized I would need full time, full time to pursue this project. So that took me to applying for a research training fellowship. And so this is the first sort of major question I had to pose for myself um, to apply for funding. And throughout your career, you'll be needing to apply for funding. Funding is going to be the core to your sustainability. And how you put, you know, design that research question at every level um, is crucial to your success. <clears throat> so the research question was quite simple. Do oocytes possess this checkpoint during that first division? Based on the high rate of missegregation, we, re we thought probably they didn't. Anyway, we were to be proven wrong. But the question needs to be novel. You, you would have heard that all of the time. And the novelty here really would be the technique that we would propose to use. 
it needs to be relevant to an important clinical problem. And in this case, it's a global phenomenon that as women get older, egg quality goes down and aneuploidy goes up. It should be specific, focused, and aligned with your area of clinical interest. It doesn't need to solve the problem at this stage, it just needs to be relevant. Uh, and the question should be designed that the answer is attainable and you must, de de you must really clearly demonstrate that you can attain this in what was a, a short time for the length of the fellowship I was applying for, two years. Two years in the scheme of research is extremely short, okay? Um, the results you produce at this sort of level may only advance the field incrementally. Uh, and you should demonstrate in your question and your commitment to the sort of project how it will be a stepping stone in your career. In other words, you are fully committed to clinical academia because the funders want, especially for fellowships, they want to invest in people that are going to grow their career and ultimately commit, uh, contribute bigger things to their clinical area. Um, so experiments are feasible, not overly ambitious. The challenge we had was, of, as I mentioned, oocytes, mammalian oocytes in particular, very difficult to come by. So restricted to mouse oocytes. And we had robust preliminary data, but at this stage, it doesn't need to be extensive. It just needs to probably illustrate the technique um, and be reasonable. At the time, GFP was a new thing. Um, say how long ago this was. So you might know, know about green fluorescent protein. So it comes from Aquaria Victoria, which is a jellyfish. Um, and it was a big hit at the time. It remains in use all the time. So fluorescently tagged proteins. It helps you to track things in living cells in real time. So locate and study protein turnover. And this was key for us, as I mentioned, who sites in short supply so we could basically study checkpoint activity in a single oocyte using fluorescence imaging, to sort of put it simple. The other challenge with oocytes is that that first meiotic division lasts about uh, 12 hours in a mouse. So it's very unsociable research, um, but time-lapse imaging helps you cover all of that. So I'm telling you this really to illustrate to you research question, how you build novelty you know, that there are different avenues you can build novelty. Here for us, it was a technique, but the question was also very important. This was the paper that came out of it, actually. Um, it actually showed that oocytes do possess a checkpoint, and it's the most, one of the most highly referenced papers on, on this topic. At the time, genes and development was quite high impact. I think it is still, although not as much as in its glory days then. <clears throat> At the same time that I was finishing my PhD, which was the mid 2000s, the RCOG began establishing a clinical academic pathway. So they are, the Royal College is the governing body for ONG in the UK. So prior to then, like I said, it was quite ad hoc. And these people who were going to be part of that career are called, were called Walport lecturers. Their name is now, it's now different. But at the time, you it was a Walport lecturer. And you had to leave the unit that you did your PhD to pursue one of these. And the second bit of serendipity I had was that I gave a talk at a prize meeting that I ended up winning. And in the audience was a guy called Professor Charles Rodek. He's a bit of a legend in obstetrics. He, he was one of the first guys to do needling of the placenta and lasering of placental connections with twins. <clears throat> he was the head of uh, obstetrics and gynae at University College London and UCLH NHS Trust. Uh, and he asked me if I'd be interested to take up a, a post there. They were coming on stream soon. Uh, and the deanery soon did advertise their first Walport lecturer post, and it was a 50-50 split where the clinical component was subspecialty training in reproductive medicine. The clinical bit was with University College London Hospitals, and the research was in John Carroll's lab. 
uh, at UCL, which was then the Department of Physiology. John is now the Dean of one of the Monash Biodiversity Units. <clears throat> so he's back in Melbourne. Once I took up the Walport Lecturer, I applied for a Welcome Trust Fellowship. And this is a 60-40 split. Now the question now needs to be more expensive. So we propose work on human oocytes and ideally it should build on your prior work. You know, it keeps your momentum going. It shows that you're evolving your research program, your own career, um, and it reinforces your position in the field. So we were building on the same story, um, but, you know, in greater depth. Uh, track record now is much more important. And in the UK, certainly for funders like the Wellcome Trust, everything is about first or last author paper and where did it get published. If you're a middle author or it's a low impact journal, you might as well not bother put it on your CV. So I put there when in Rome because that's how the UK is still. Australia is virtually the opposite. So when I came here, it was a big shock to, to me because we built our career there on a particular model. And then you come here and realize, actually, it's a lot of volume you get credited for, as well as not necessarily first or last author paper. So it's important to know the local playing field. <clears throat> Um, at this level of fellowship, environment is a lot more important because you need to demonstrate another level of performance, demonstrate access to collaborators. And in my case, it was the IVF unit, which I happened to be training in as well, where we could access human oocytes. Um, on the practical side, what you find is a constant sort of conflict with the clinical work as a trainee um, and my work was lab-based so when I was doing my research I was out of sight the clinic didn't see me my consultants were not happy because they couldn't reach me on those days and nor should they be able to and that's the point of the fellowship to give you protected time but clinical work never works like that you are always you always need to be accessible for patients that you might have uh, been involved with <clears throat> But anyway, that's remained a constant source of friction. We published this paper uh, out of that fellowship. I put this up because I highlighted a protein there that it was based on. It's BABAR1, because that would form the basis of my next um, sort of research question. Um, and this came about from serendipity number three. So I, I happened to speak at a... There's this group of gynae, senior gynae consultants <clears throat> called the gynae travelers. They travel around the world. I don't know. It seems like a big um, sort of social event, but this year UCL hosted the gynae travelers. And in the audience was Michael Chapman, who is quite a senior IVF professor in Australia. He's one of the founding fathers of, of IVF here. And he was head of um, the ONG research department at UNSW, which was earmarked as a sort of floundering research unit. And they got money to recruit people to build their unit. And this was through their strategic priority fund. So he asked me if I fancy going to Sydney. Um, and at the time, the NHS, well, it's crumbling even more now. But it was initially starting to crumble then. Crumble meaning that um, as a researcher, your research time was constantly being eroded. The NHS was expecting you to do a lot more in your own time. Anyway, I relocated, final relocation to Australia uh, in 2014. And what happened then was my fourth serendipity, which was this paper came out here. Um, 
with these two guys on it, Lindsay Wu and David Sinclair. So they actually led the aging lab at UNSW. David Sinclair is quite a famous professor in, in anti-aging. His thing is NAD. I don't know if you've heard of it, but NAD is this very, very, very interesting agent that goes down with aging. Anyway, what caught my eye was the title that this CERT2 in CERT2 basically regulates Bob R1 stability. Uh, Bob R1 had been known for some time. If you remember, that's the paper we published on oocytes. And it had been linked to aging before by Jan van Doysen. And um, so it really started to become a focus for me because we had published that paper. And what really made this link interesting now with the sirtuins is that sirtuins are NAD dependent. So now you have an NAD dependent protein that's regulating a key regulator of oocyte quality. NAD is modifiable through diet. So here we have an opportunity through some sort of therapeutic oral intervention to potentially modify oocytes by modifying a key regulator. Um, so I emailed David and said, oh, I saw your paper. We published this paper. He said, ah, oh, yes, I know your paper. And um, in literally about 10 minutes, Lindsay Wu was at my door in UNSW. I didn't know at the time that they had a lab just below our floor. Uh, and he's very much um, entrepreneurial, um, David Sinclair. And at the time they were looking to build actually a fertility avenue. And this just sort of aligned perfectly. So NAD levels go down with aging in all somatic cells that we know, and it's really linked to the aging phenomenon. So David has shown uh, in his lab out of Harvard that if you restore NAD, you can basically prevent aging. So you can live longer and live healthier in mice. Um, he, that said, he takes it, he has his dad on it. Um, anyway, coming back to the research question. So now we started looking at NHMRC projects and development grants. At that time, it was still called a project grant. The research question now has to be much more ambitious. Uh, we, need, we want to demonstrate translation, potential for translation. So we want to show that our idea can improve oocyte quality and ultimately pregnancy success. It addresses a major clinical problem. There's a novel concept. Uh, we have robust collaboration. So all of these things now, you can see the research question growing in terms of the meatiness, the impact. <clears throat> uh, we need much more extensive preliminary data for this level of application. And what I noticed with NHMRC grants, you basically need to have the paper written already when you submit the grant. So by the time the grant actually gets awarded, that paper is in press. So you publish the work you propose to do. So what you do with your grant is actually build the data for your next grant. So that's your strategy. <clears throat> um, we need you need to know the local scene. So IVF in Australia is all in the private sector. That doesn't mesh well with a public funding agency. So you need to be careful to avoid any benefit to IVF. I didn't tell you that, but that's just the just something to bear in mind. I didn't want right in the grant for this to be seen as anything that's going to prop up the IVF industry. In fact, you can turn it to your advantage and argue that the treatment we propose, which is true, will reduce the need for expensive IVF altogether. So a lot of people who end up in IVF are because of poor equality. Uh, and leverage increased public awareness. So this is something that's been in the media increasingly. We're increasingly seeing more and more women having children or attempting to do so later in life and the courier mail around that time had, you know, a few headline stories. <clears throat> so this is the holy grail of reproductive medicine. We want to convert poor eggs into good eggs. Um, if I could do that, I'd be really rich. Because that is why 
that's the big stumbling block in, in IVF. We can't improve egg quality. So what we do is we get a lot more eggs to increase the chances of getting one good one. <clears throat> Uh, and this is the paper that came out from that collaborator. So we got at least two NHMRC grants and a, and a development grant. Uh, and we showed that NAD goes down in new sites and that we could restore it by feeding mice and NAD precursor, NMN. Uh, so there you have a possible treatment that could, you know, oral intervention that could potentially really revolutionize the fertility industry. Um, serendipity number five was the Christopher Chen Chair in Reproductive Medicine came up at the University of Queensland. So I was headhunted for this chair at the minute I landed in, in Sydney, actually. And I sort of put it off for a year, but then they came back. They, the endowed chairs is a huge donation from Christopher Chen. His story is interesting. He's the, first, he's the guy to freeze, have a live birth from the first human frozen egg and that work he did in Adelaide. But he is a very wealthy private IVF specialist who has his own company in Singapore. So he donated 10 million to set up an endowed chair in his name at UQ. So basically the endowment, the corpus is invested and the interest is what we live off. From the interest, you basically get enough money to do research, the equivalent of a project grant running in perpetuity. Um, the requirements of the chair was a unique combination. You have to be subspecialty trained clinically and have a big research portfolio. There aren't many people in Australia who have that because all of IVF is in the private sector. And in fact, in Queensland, most people, 95% or more, are not subspecialty trained fertility specialists. They do it as an add-on to a generalist career. So anyway, that suited me perfectly. And uh, what I liked about it was the funding. Now, the research question remained about what I had built before. So when I came to interview, this is what I talked about you know, building a world-leading state-of-the-art unit for USAID research based on time-lapse imaging and embryo imaging, but also at the time we were doing work on NAD. So we had a major traction with a potential translational impact. Um, our current question is about selecting embryos non-invasively. So you can imagine if you have 10 embryos in IVF, I want to know which one to put back first. The current approach, and this as a clinician, I'm not just telling you my story for telling you sake, but I'm trying to illustrate to you that me as a clinician, I have unique insight into how that IVF lab works. I know what my challenges are as a clinician, and I know what I would like to have. Uh, and I know the workflow of the lab, so I know what can fit in there and be practically useful and what is practically useless. Okay, so what we want is something that can pick an embryo and I can transfer it fresh. Right now, we have to biopsy embryos, which is quite invasive. It's destructive and wait for the result to come back, which means we have to freeze embryos for two weeks at least. So if we could pick an embryo real time, live, and put it back fresh, we can move forward the agenda quite quickly. And all embryos, certainly at QFG, go into time-lapse incubators now. They're called embryoscopes. And we do time-lapse imaging research, so it really aligns very well. So here's an opportunity for us to use this, capitalize on our knowledge of time-lapse to pick embryos. And we actually, have been doing work on embryos recently. So my PhD student published this recently. We, we found based that nuclei, which is colored in, this is a time-lapse series of, an, of mouse embryo dividing. But what we found was that nuclei move all the way out to the cortex, which is on the 1.5 hour mark, the two arrows, which was surprising. Because if you move a nucleus off center, the next division is at risk of dividing asymmetrically. 
And what we find is asymmetric division compromises embryo development. So this is our hook now for something that can help us identify embryos that may not be developmentally good down the track. So that we're actually applying this to the embryoscope data in from QFG patients. Um, so to end, um, building the research question is incremental and it's a career long exercise as I've illustrated to you, my sort of sequence of building questions. And it involves multiple, but increasingly ambitious questions. Uh, you need to address an important clinical problem, use novel approaches. You'll hear that all the time. Not always easy to do, but by being expansive of, of your, about your thinking, you can sometimes inflate the significance of what you're doing. Um, each question should be appropriate to the career stage. So don't try to solve oocyte quality in your PhD fellowship. You know, it just needs to be um, appropriate to the stage and helpful if the questions build on a similar theme so you can build your and strengthen your track record and promote your recognition in the field. The work doesn't always have to be conducted in the clinic, as I've shown you, uh, but it doesn't have help um, to help you coordinate it with your clinical work. Um, capitalize on your insight, your unique insight into patient care, because this will determine the practicality of what you propose. I've seen a lot of stuff published, really interesting, good science, totally useless from a practical point of view, because it just does not fit into the workflow of a clinical treatment cycle. Uh, be on the lookout for overlaps all the time with other fields and potential collaborators. And in my case, it was the anti-aging field. Uh, a lot of it is serendipitous. You often have to have a nomadic ex ex um, existence for quite some time, and it's always unpredictable. Uh, and I'll end there. Uh, thank you, Professor, Professor Homer. Uh, whilst people prepare their uh, questions, I just wanted to ask, um, throughout your, your research, you've transitioned from primarily working in murine models in, in mice, and then over time has moved more towards more well, replicable models, which is literally humans. Mm. Uh, is there a point where you can recognize that Yes, uh, well, th there's a common uh, complaint that, that researchers are becoming incredibly uh, proficient at curing mice diseases. Uh, is, there, is there a point at which point you can uh, recognize that, no, this research is applicable in mouse models versus this research is completely irrelevant and must be done in the human? Yeah, I, I think, so it's how much does the mouse work relevant uh, human stuff. Um, the mouse is a good model, actually, when it comes to oocytes. They age a lot quicker than we do. So an old mouse is only like 18 months. 18 months, they're postmenopausal. Um, however, in my field, the regulation around human oocytes and embryos are even worse, is completely, um, it prevents research in that area entirely. I don't know a single project in Australia that has an embryo research license. That has to go to the NHMRC. It's very, very heavily regulated. The clinic I did my PhD in in Newcastle, they were the first to publish on mitochondrial disease. And that's what's forming the basis for this, for the Australian move to treat mitochondrial disease, but the, the loop hoops they had to go through in the UK to get approval to use human embryos was incredibly strict. So that's the problem, the, the regulation, and depending on your country, it's very strict, a lot less strict in China. Uh, so that might be a place to go, but it's mouse, and then you have to apply your, apply, your knowledge of what is already captured and use that. So well, like I said, embryoscope data, we can use that. We don't need to destroy the embryo, you know, because it's captured anyway. We can just look at the images 
we don't compromise any patient um I, you know personal information or anything like that so you just need to have workarounds you know have your model in the mouse maybe and then look at how you can extract relevant information in humans but it's the it's the regulation <clears throat> uh, do we have any uh, just uh over here on the far side uh just behind you then oh yes um, so the question is, is there a commercial product, um, NAD product? NAD itself is very unstable, so you can't take NAD. It's sold, don't get me wrong, but it won't do anything. Um, you need an NAD precursor, and the one we studied was NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. There's another one called nicotinamide riboside, NR. Uh, but NMN is the one more studied. There are lots of companies, but they're all um, supplement companies that provide NMN. One of the better looking ones that I've seen is from Renew by Science. Um, but I can't advise you on those. <laughs> uh, but we that's that's what's available. And as you mentioned that, it's one of the reasons we... So we started a... a company to try to get trials done and so on jumpstart fertility but couldn't get it off the ground because um the supplements are already out there so it's going to be hard to patent a new product and no one wants to invest in something they can't patent <clears throat> the other problem with ivf patients is if you figure out for some reason you're in a no treatment arm you will find it and get use it. So it does compromise your your trials. 